freshman student <laughs> over to the shop, to the stadium, to um, learn how to appropriately do the cheers. So I'm Margo Izzo, and I work at the Nysauger Center, and I want to introduce Carrie Krantz Edison, who directs the ACE program, and Patty Conkey, who is a career specialist. And in my mind, Patty has the toughest job of all because she works with individuals with disabilities to try to figure out what the best job match is so that she can place them on internships. And so if you've got questions about how to place people on internships and what kind of internships, she's the expert on that area. I'm not the expert. <laughs> <laughs> So, Nye Songer Center, how many are you familiar with Nye Songer Center? All right, all right. So, for those whose hands didn't go up, we're a university center of excellence on developmental disabilities. And so, there are 67 USADs across the nation, one in every single state. And so, uh, and these were initiated after, uh, Wow, President Kennedy was in service. And so he laid the groundwork for university centers who would deliver service, conduct research, and educate people on all types of disability issues. And then he also funded the protective advocacy services. So there are, is free legal advice for anybody in the state and also the DD Council. And so the USED network, um, there's one in every state. In, in large states, there's two. Ohio has one in Cincinnati and Columbus. So how many of you are from Ohio? OK, good. We have a good Ohio audience. Um, so at Nysauger Center, we've done a variety of projects around disability. We currently have the um, Office of Special Ed Programs, U.S. Department of Ed, Scaling Up and Vision It. And this is a free online curriculum that schools can use to help students with and without disabilities from seventh grade to through high school figure out what their passion for working is. Um, Where is that from? I'm sorry? Where is that from? This is a project that we're delivering here at Ohio State, and it's free. And I'm going to pass this around, and I'm also going to pass around a sign-up sheet. And then I will email you an electronic version of this. And so I'm going to send that around, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Envision It, because ideally, people come to the patties of the world with an idea of what they want to do. But so many of our students, with and without disabilities, don't have a clue. So we felt career development and transition planning was critical. And the best people to do that transition planning are the students themselves. You know, They're the ones who have to have the tools. Um, we've had a National Science Foundation grant um, in the 2012, no, 28, 2008 to 12, uh, Chris Atkinson has a lot of National Science Foundation grants. And what's great about National Science Foundation grants is they often pay students to get those valuable work experiences. Um, and man, if you went to Chris's presentation, he takes students to Ireland and Arizona and all How over the world. How do I work for you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nope, you gotta stay. No. <laughs> Sorry. You can Sorry. If you want. I believe everybody should. My kids still talk move about on. Me. Okay. We did receive, no, we applied for funding for additional NSF funding, and Chris <laughs> is a partner in that grant. And we'll be selecting eight students at The Ohio State University, and Chris will be selecting eight students at University of Cincinnati. And there are universities across the United States who will have $2,000 each for students majoring in STEM to um, enhance their work experience or conference presentations, that type of thing. And it's a five-year grant. We're hoping it wins. We also have 
the Office of Post-Secondary Ed, U.S. Department of Ed, the Ohio Statewide Consortium. So say you are an individual with an intellectual <coughs> or developmental disability, we've put together a network of universities that offers programs for individuals with intellectual disabilities. And I'm gonna pass this around so you can see what this is, and then if you sign up on the sheet, you will receive a digital copy of that as well. Mark, okay. quickly, is yeah. that also housed on the Nice Lumber website, or is it just information that you would have to send? You know, it is not on the Nice Lumber website, okay. so it's on the Ohio State Board Consortium website, okay. but I, I'll send it out digitally, <laughs> and that's a really good suggestion. Another question? Do you want to also send the presentation? Yeah. Sure, of course, I'll send the presentation as well. And so the Ohio Statewide Consortium will be sustained through private pay. And finally, the ACE program is an uh, initiative that's been at Ohio State. Karen France is the program manager. And she's going to be um, taking about 10 or 15 minutes to go into detail about the ACE program. So that's what we are. I know many of you are from Ohio. How many of you are parents? Okay. Uh, and how many of you are parents of students with disabilities? All right, good. And um, how many of you work at the college level? All right. And how many of you work in K-12? All right, excellent, excellent. We've got a wonderful audience. So what I want to do is just start by saying we need to confirm a STEAM career goal as early as possible because any career in science, technology, engineering, the arts, or mathematics will require a solid foundation. And um, in our first National Science Foundation grant, we found that students interested in STEAM express those interests at a very young age. I mean, parents looked at their five-year-old and said, man, I think he really likes to build things. I think engineering is a great plan. Or, man, he loves math, and he's picked up his, his facts and figures so quickly. Or he's artistic. And so we, we know that STEAM interest, career interest, <coughs> starts very young. But what happens sometimes in the K-12 special ed system is once you become identified with an IEP as a person with a disability, they lower expectations. And I have personal experience with this because my daughter went on an IEP and suddenly they wanted to put her in the easy math class. Well, math was hard for her, but she could learn it instead of putting her in the easy math class, let's give her the support so she can achieve and learn those critical math skills that she's going to need. So if you are working with the K-12 system, remember, an IEP doesn't mean you lower expectations. It means you build and scaffold the supports that students need. So students can plan to gain the skills needed through their high school course of study. And that's one of the things that the Envision It curriculum does, is it tells students, um, based on age-appropriate transition assessments, what careers are a good match for them. And then the student learns to do research using the internet to figure out, I mean, did you know how many different types of engineering there are? I mean, it's amazing. Did you know how many different kinds of jobs use math as the basis? And you can learn that on the internet, but you have to know how to search for it. So that's what Envision It does. Students can explore what type of STEAM uh, career best meets their assets. And one of the things that Envision It does is it really focuses on your assets, not your disabilities. And then they can begin to explore STEAM careers as early as elementary school in robotics, summer camps. Ohio State has more summer camps. In fact, the yoga gets pushed off campus because we have so many summer camps that we can't teach yoga on campus anymore. 
So, um, and so it's important to start early. Question? Yeah. Summer camps for how old? Oh, there are all types of ages. There's elementary school summer camps, there's summer camps in the arts, um, and information technology and using technology for women, since that's an underrepresented group. Are um, they and day so, camps or just? There's a variety, it depends. You have to just kind of search, honestly. I know there's high school camps as well, mm -hmm. and a variety of different um, areas. So the best thing I suggest is like, if there's a particular um, thing that your child might be interested in, to Google that and see if Ohio, because honestly, we have no, I personally have no idea um, all the camps that Ohio State offers. Yes. And also Cincinnati, Chris, I'm sure there are camps in Cincinnati as well. And I can't, are there summer camps at Kent State University? I'm not sure there are. All right. There, there are high school art summer camps at Kent State, and I know that because I was in one once. There we go. <laughs> there we go. At Wright State? Good. Do you have summer camps at Wright State? Yes. No. Yeah, and summer camps at Wright State. And so those are a great, I, I know, um, like heavens, my daughters are um, in their 30s now, but I looked for daycare for them because I work 12 months a year, and what? better opportunity than instead of dropping them at daycare or having them come to have a, having somebody come watch them if they go to camps um, there's lots of camps at the zoo that are very popular as well so I'm going to switch gears now envision it is a curriculum that has had 13 years of federal funding to develop so we've we feel we have some excellent course models that have been vetted by students with and without disabilities and teachers. Um, there are 13 different course models for the Envision It curriculum. And so you can have a one semester career advising or a one semester transition planning um, class, or you can integrate it into an English or a uh, family consumer science class um, that's going to be taught all <coughs> year. It's aligned with the Common Core Standards in English Language Arts, and it supports students' IEP. The student, as part of the curriculum, actually completes an age-appropriate transition assessment and then um, writes their own measurable post-secondary goals for employment, and measurable post-secondary goals for further education and training after they've researched what their career of interest wants. Now, I know lots and lots of students who want to be video gamers or YouTube <laughs> producers or veterinarians, and they can use the internet to find all those related jobs to video gamers and what the entry level jobs are and what kind of certificates, degrees, or industry recognized credential will enhance your ability to enter that career. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so students actually build their digital transition portfolio and in an ideal world, they present their transition portfolio at their IEP meeting, and their IEP reflects the research that the students have done. So it includes age-appropriate transition assessments, and it's also uh, been universally designed. So it's good for students with and without disabilities. Question. Quick question, is this only for students in Ohio, or? No, we have scaled it up okay. in Connecticut, um, <coughs> in Illinois, Utah, Arizona, not Arizona, okay. <laughs> but but we are writing a new grant in Nevada. We are in Nevada, so what in Michigan? So and it's free, so people can um, people can scale it up. So Michigan's the next request, Margot. So Michigan, yes. okay, yeah, all right, Michigan. all right. We're I usually will. against uh, supporting that state, but maybe in this case <laughs> we'll consider it. No, in this room we are all inclusive. We <laughs> use the letter M and the word Michigan. It's okay. You know, as long as they. I'm, I'm a U of M girl and my husband's Eastern, but my son's a big fan of Ohio State right now. All so, right. you know. Yeah, Eastern Michigan's got a great program. So. Yeah. 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 Good. 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 
So uh, we learned a lot from our National Science Foundation grant, and I just want to give a couple of key things. So it was funded from 2008 to 13. We partnered with Wright State University. Um, boy, John Flack, is he still there? No. <laughs> oh, no! All right, all right. Well, anyways, all right, let's go to the next slide. Um, we learned that ability advising is key. Students who have a person who meets with them regularly before they need help is key. What happens is in high school, we have intervention specialists who are there with the supports before the student hardly realizes they needed supports. But in college, it's up to the students. And there's so much stigma associated with having a disability that um, <coughs> students don't disclose and then they don't get this ability advising. ACE provides ability advising, in a sense, to college students with disabilities. And um, I have a disability, and my daughter has a disability, and I know the stigma associated with having a disability. Um, college, 60% of college students say, I don't have a disability. I'm not going to disclose. I don't, I'm so tired of that label, that stigma, that, that embarrassing uh, fact that I learn differently. And we're making a huge effort through this conference, through our projects, to normalize disability and say, hey, if you finish a college degree program, you have the same earning potential as anybody without a disability, but you have to complete the college program. And 75% of students with disabilities who get the supports they need in a timely basis, whether it's by Karen or Patty prompting them to get the supports or they just received those self-advocacy skills and that knowledge and awareness in high school so they know how to get the supports. Or, come on parents, how many of us <coughs> have pushed our kids into the supports that they need, although it's harder when your kid's in college. And so we know that ability advising is key. And the next slide kind of talks about what the ability advisor does, is that, um, we delivered a student learning community where we had students develop a self-advocacy plan based on their assets. And we had college students who were working on STEM degrees who didn't know much beyond what label they had. So yeah, I have a learning disability, but um, what are the accommodations that really help me succeed and meet the high expectations that college has for students. That's what students learned. And a quick, quick um, tip that we learned from student learning communities is if you take the VARC, V-A-R-K, it's in the Envision and Curriculum, and it also is in um, free on the internet, so you don't have to get the Envision and Curriculum to get it. It will give you your own personal learning style. And so you'll learn if you're a visual learner or a kinesthetic learner or an oral learner. But what's even more important is it will teach you how to study based on your learning style. And so you then become um, if you're a visual learner, it has suggestions for these are the most <coughs> effective ways to study. And our STEM students did not realize that. And we had students who had flunked out from three different universities. And they were at Ohio State, so we knew they had good ACT and SAT scores. They were bright kids. But until they figured out how to study, they weren't being successful. Um, ability advice, yeah, all right. Mentoring is another key um, support service that can be, um, can make all the difference in the world. However, it's time consuming to implement. Um, and 
Karen would probably say and Patty would say that they are the mentors for the students that they advise. Um, we tried many different forms of mentoring. We took um, high school students and we matched them with undergraduate STEM students to mentor the high school students. And college students are really busy. So figuring out how to do that mentoring took time and we tried electronic mentoring. And that's what Cheryl Bergstaller believes in as well, is electronic mentoring. Because once you have a relationship, I mean, I have a relationship with my husband, but I probably text him more than <laughs> I talk to him some days. <laughs> mentors for undergraduate and graduate students. And um, professionals, we recruited faculty from Ohio State to mentor STEM students at Ohio State. So mentoring is a great, but it's time consuming. Internships equals employment. We found that the single most important intervention that we could deliver to students were helping them find a good internship. And there's strong evidence that internships improve employment outcomes because it, it's a time limited um, time for 10 weeks or a semester or summer where students are working with an employer. <coughs> in STEM, many of those internships are paid, but in the real world outside of STEM, I don't want to say the real world, but in the world outside of STEM, many internships are paid. And whether they're paid or not, I would definitely try to start doing internships as quick as possible. And we've used many, many different internship sites. So now Karen is gonna tell you about ACE, and I'm so excited about this program because she's saving lives. So, um, so based on the, uh, the support, or the um, success that the TOPS program had, um, my former uh, director was able to go ahead and utilize his LEN students. LEN students are trainees from the, um, at the Nice Somber Center who participate in a program called Leadership and Education in Neurodevelopmental and related disorders. Um, so we took the knowledge from Tufts and then utilized this to create a program that helps support college students, not only at The Ohio State University, but at Columbus State, <coughs> at the regional campuses, and hopefully Otterbein this fall, um, really learn those skills that they need, not only to be successful in college, but how to be successful after they go ahead and move on to their careers. So it's an adaptable program. We make sure that we are utilizing skills and techniques that will help each individual student. It's not cookie cutter, it's not a one size fits all. We know our students aren't one size fits all. Um, we know everyone, no matter their person, whether they have a label of diversity, or neurodiversity or neurodivergence um, or neurotypical, we all have our own individualized learning ways. So how do we help support those students here on campus? And then again, how do we teach them and generalizable skills that they're going to take off campus? So current staffing right now, um, I'm the program manager. Uh, if anyone was in the uh, presentation prior to this one, uh, the three individuals who presented are interns right now who are facilitators working with our college student. Again, peer support is so important although they are learning their boundaries as professionals, as coming from the College of Social Work, on campus, they look like a peer. They come from that level of, they know what's going on in, your, in that other person's shoes, in our student's shoes. Um, and they have the advantage of us in the office, um, myself and my colleagues, um, through the TOPS program, through the Aspirations program, and again, through the support from that LEND program at the Nysonger Center at Ohio State we have the knowledge to be able to develop the interventions, train them how to use those interventions in the field, and for our A students, it's seamless. They look like they're working with another college student on campus, just like everybody else. Takes away that stigma of being that kid in the resource room, or that kid that ends up being, you know, Again, stigmatized, ostracized, whatever the case is. Um, young young person earlier, you know, talked about how everybody in his elementary school hated him. Well, a lot of our folks come to that campus with that feeling, and they just want to blend in with their 60,000 closest friends here. Uh, they don't want to stand out. So again, how do we keep that there for them? All right. Um, so again, our goals: we really want to empower them. How are they going to become their own self advocates? 
Um, how do we connect them to student supports? If you've ever looked at the Ohio State website, it is overwhelming. So for somebody who knows what they want to find, it's challenging. If you don't know what you really need and you don't know where to start because you don't have executive function, it's almost impossible. So again, how do we team and be able to help the students find what they need on campus? Again, we come from a social work perspective versus an educational perspective or a psychological psychological, that medical model, we want to work with the person in their environment. We want them to develop the skills and the coping mechanism that they need once they move out from here, they start to feel okay <coughs> as an adult. We want students to prepare more effectively, pre prepare to communicate more effectively. We want to make sure <coughs> that they know how to say what they need. Again, if anyone was here listening to Tema in the last presentation, she's learning, she's doing a great job, but she's learned along the way. So how can we start earlier? Um, Sanai, who's in the room with me right now, was in our program. And again, he looked at me going, wow, I met you as a senior. What would have happened if I would have met you as a freshman? So now, how can we you know, really look at you know, serving our students once they come from high school and, and serving them you know, from the time they enter? Um, so they, they don't hit those missteps or those miscues. And then we're helping students to develop their social skills, how to make those connections, how to be able to, when they need to mask, but then how do they need to effectively communicate, whether that's oral, whether that's written, and then how to kind of take that, the, the emotion, the frustration, or again, that overload, and then take that out of their communications. All right, so again, we try to deal with the challenges. Students come from a beautiful, supported high school environment. Maybe not so beautiful for every student, but at least that's the grand scheme of things. Um, our Board of Education should be providing that ideal situation for all of our students. Challenging coming here though, managing time and priorities. You know, now students are living on campus or living at home, no one's telling them when to get up. If they haven't learned how to use the assistive technology that's as simple as their cell phone, it becomes challenging when they're here working independently. The unspoken rules, huge challenge for a lot of our folks. And then not only do they have these unspoken rules, they have nobody to talk to when they have a challenge or a problem with those unspoken rules. Um, avoidance in socializing. They want to belong to the Lego Club, they want to belong to the Disney Club. We have 1,100 clubs here on campus um, at Ohio State. Regional campus has many, Columbus <coughs> State has many. But if they have a hard enough time getting through their classes during the day, how are they going to walk into this unfamiliar setting, an unfamiliar situation, and be able to connect with people at the different organizations that are on campus? And then communicating with professors and staff. You don't just have one professor, you have a professor, and then you have a graduate assistant, and then there's a teaching assistant, and oh, there's office staff to deal with. So again, it's not just that one-on-one -on -one communication that they had in high school. How do they now broaden their horizons and be able to communicate on a level with each of those staff members? Um, and then understanding their peers' expectations and their peers' perspective as well as staff perspective. Mm. So individuals who might be a little loud when they get excited, oh my gosh, you know, now a professor's gonna say, oh, aggressive. No, they weren't aggressive, they were assertive. Were they upset because they asked a question and the professor didn't even look at them when they gave the answer, didn't take into consideration who they were as a person? You know, again, not all of our professors are perfect. They're gonna make mistakes, I make mistakes. But you know, how, do, how do we help to overcome some of those challenges and provide some support? So again, we do this by really providing that individualized service. We offer a, anywhere between two and four hours of individualized supports per week. We offer some group study sessions. And in all of these sessions, we work in that social communication piece. It's all psychosocial, psychoeducational. Somebody says, well, what's your curriculum? I said, every session. You know, we, we work on planning an organization. We work on those communication skills. If your student needs to learn how to script, they need to learn how to script, you know? If they've never had the conversation to ask for their accommodation, if they've never had the conversation to ask for additional time, or even just to have the conversation in general with a professor or with a peer, they need to learn how to do this. Um, again, does it get a little more nuanced? Is it more sophisticated? <coughs> Absolutely. So again, all of our plans are individualized. We're not going to be able to say this works for everybody. And not only do we offer this, <coughs> but we make sure that students are connected on campus with the services that can also support them because they pay for it in their tuition. All right, so 2018, 2019, we've been doing this since 2016. 
Uh, our first cohort, we had four individuals. Our second cohort, we had nine individuals. Um, and then we moved out. So we ended up having a total of 14 individuals work with our program. Um, one of our members graduated in 2019. In the year prior, we had one individual who, two individuals who graduated from the Fisher College of Business. Um, the individual who graduated in December 19, no opportunities for internships from his college. He didn't know who to ask, he didn't go to the right person, and thank you Jason for helping out because again, through, uh, through networking, we found him some opportunities to where maybe he'll get connected with those right people in his field. Um, again, I <coughs> graduated two years ago, is employed right now with Ernst & Young. The other challenge is his colleague who graduated at the same time, finance degree, 3.2 GPA, Fisher College, still is not employed. Is he as communicative? Is he as client-facing as Sinai? No, he's not, and that's the problem. He doesn't fit into that cookie cutter, this is what a Fisher College student looks like or should be. So, um, this, in 2018, 2019, we had five STEM majors, nine were liberal arts majors, and then no internships. Many of our individuals, though, had part-time jobs, which was great. They worked on campus, they worked off campus, but the jobs weren't in their career fields. These were just part-time jobs. So for 2019-2020 coming on board, we have eight members who are returning. We have five new members that are added. We still have some that are sitting on the fence because they're not sure of how they're going to move forward in their degree. Maybe they need a gap year. Um, we have one member that's scheduled to graduate December of 19. At this point in time, he's working part-time, but no internships. And this is a gentleman who is in um, professional writing. He blogs. He's got some <coughs> great online fan fiction that he writes. But again, he's not your typical individual who's going to be applying for a position. Does he have great skills? Absolutely. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, well, I'm having the national internship program. <gasps> We're going to talk. Entry <laughs> I have a lot of applicants on the spectrum, but they don't want to leave home. And I can't get the local internships. Mm -hmm. Is this a big issue that people won't leave home because they think the supports won't be there in other states? Absolutely, and I think you know part of it, we work with a lot of students who for the first time are leaving home, whether they're living on campus or commuting. So one of the things that we try to work with is developing what that next step is for them. How do they develop <coughs> the skills to not have to live at home? And frankly, in the state of Ohio, most of our students do not have county board support. So any supports that they had, their parents went out, they paid for them, we teach them how to find those supports. So. I think you know, some of our conversations with Sanai after he graduated were not so much of, you know, what, it, it, no, actually it was the what's next. You know, what do you need to do for yourself? How do you need to look for the supports? And we try to start early teaching individuals that this is your time to find your practitioners. You're gonna work with somebody for the rest of your life, find the people you wanna work with, who work well with you, and who can support you. So. And there are also parents who don't want their Young people to go away sure. to another state, or, and I just don't know how to make that comfortable. And our next piece is the parent training because we know there's helicopter parents, there's snowplow parents, there's the parents who are so enmeshed, or they have their identity enmeshed with their child, right? So th if their child is broken, they're somebody. If their child isn't broken, and those children aren't, these young adults are not broken. They are talented, they are capable, but they do things differently and that's okay. So how do we start to teach those parents? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yes. So in my school, we have a lot of students that get internships through their departments, mm -hmm. but when I call to try to get them accommodations, we get some pushback, because a lot of the STEM fields I found are a little old school. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have any um, suggestions on how to cultivate those relationships while also being firm? I think Patty is going to go ahead and kind of address some of those things in her, in her portion of the presentation because, again, this is a challenge. It is getting those businesses to allow um, those supports to come in. And I think, again, Dr. Grant, <laughs> um, you know, has, we have to be able to be very clear and concrete on what those supports should be. 
Part of the issue too, though, is you know when our students come in, um, it's that intellectual property or the company liability if they're allowing in a job coach or an employment specialist who's going to job carve. So again, I think we have to get kind of creative, but I think Patty's going to address that. So I would make the suggestion of looking on the Jan. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know that website? It's the Job Accommodation Network, where you can look up the disability and look up what the accommodations should be at a work site, and that gives you some leverage to be able to, you know, because oftentimes, like, we have this summer program right now, which is at TOPS, um, where we work with individuals who are currently in the uh, workshops, and um, we have somebody with Crater Willie, which is not a disability I've ever currently worked with, and actually, that one's not actually on the uh, website. <laughs> uh, but, so we had to do some thinking outside the box where I had to call the work site and say, you know, I of course couldn't disclose what this individual's disability is. But I had to say, due to a medical reason, this individual is not supposed to be exposed to food. Um, so we talked it through. And so we made some um, suggestions where like for this particular internship where they're gonna start like at a rec center where they're at the pole, where there is no food. Um, and then when they come back in the afternoon, they were gonna work in the arts and crafts room where there is no food. So like, I know that doesn't necessarily answer your question, but um, I would start with the job accommodation network and then get creative, you know, and, and talk to the work sites and, you know, reassure them that they have the work skills needed to do the job. They just need some assistance. And this is what, you know, we have found to be successful. You know, sometimes they just need that written task list or a picture schedule or, um, you know, just a variety of different things. And that's hard as a job coach even to figure out what the student needs, to be quite honest. It's a lot of trial and error. So I think you have to, you have to eventually just get comfortable being a little bit more aggressive which can be hard. Right. So, um, assertive. Assertive. Assertive, assertive. Assertive, assertive, I guess, is probably better, but right. yes. Right. One of the things that um, I want to point out is we have an opportunity because there is a worker shortage in our field. And business, more than ever before in my career of 40 years, is coming to the table saying, I'm willing to adjust my interview process. Uh, and not expect to hire the person with the best social skills who can give me a firm handshake and eye contact. They realize that having a firm handshake doesn't make you the best quality control auditor in a, in a bank to make sure that um, posts are and debits and audits and are, are done appropriately. And so this is a good time and it's also Another good reason why it's better for K-12 and universities to set up these internships because we take liability off the table. They're doing this internship as part of our program, so the university is the one who is liable. We have to make sure that they're either getting credit or it's part of the program course of study and then liability is off the table. Yeah, that's a big thing, liability. We get that question all the time. Like, I'm willing to consider this, but what if they get hurt on the job? You know, what, who's liable? And, you know, we're able to say Ohio State is in this case. But again, if an employee gets hurt on the job, there, you know, again, right. things happen. So right. again, it's, but it's a matter of who is but going to be. Right. Right. So again, I think one of the things that we really want to see move forward is how do we connect, make those connections making sure our individuals who graduate are ready to be our job ready. So it's not just a matter of having the education, but how to apply the educational information that they, that they receive. How do they understand the rigor of work? And as Dr. Temple alluded to earlier today, how are they ready to ask concretely for the accommodations that they need, which typically don't cost a lot of money, will probably be provided by the individual themselves, and it's, again, not only how do they take care of them at the workplace, but how do they take care of themselves after the workplace? How do they have their decomp time? What are they doing to make sure they're refilling their well? They're making sure that they are addressing their sensory issues. A lot of these things, it's not rocket science. It's a lot of just, it's evidence-based work and it's plain common sense, but it has to be put into place early because you're not gonna transition into a new job, oh, and transition into all of the accommodations that you're gonna do for yourself. Right. So the internship is great also mm -hmm. to teach the student what accommodations they really do need, whether it's 
It's a 15 minute break every um, two hours or three hours, or I have to have water available 20, you know, whenever I'm presenting, because I'm on medication and I have cotton mouth. And so, mm -hmm. you know, those kinds of things can be negotiated Absolutely. by a Karen or a Patty, and, and then the student realizes that that's something that I need. Sure, or again, what are those workplace accommodations? It, are there employee assistance programs? My gosh, use them. This is part of what you get as your company benefit utilize them. How is this here? But I think we also have to educate the businesses. How is it that they can help accommodate individuals that it isn't just the accommodation for the student who is neurodiverse or the, excuse me, the employee who's neurodiverse. It's the accommodation that will help every one of their employees. Mm -hmm. It makes it a friendly environment for everyone to work. And I think as we know with our incoming millennials, they want to know that their company will embrace diversity mm -hmm. at any level whether it's because of ethnicity, whether it's because of you know, orientation, whether it's sexual, whether it's gender, or again, whether it's neurodiversity, that we think differently, we learn differently, but we also have, again, those fabulous pieces, those fabulous brains that can do a lot more um, than what maybe even a typical peer can. So, and again, I think Bill Wong states it best that the ind autistic individuals to succeed in this world, they need to find their strengths and the people that will help them so again, the allies, whether it's in the community, at home, your own, their own new social circle, other, outside of the family, or again, within employment, um, to help them get their hopes and dreams. And that was our initial, original, original cohort, most of them. So, <laughs> all right, all right. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about a, uh, a fairly new initiative. It's College Programs for Students with Intellectual Disabilities. And, uh, People with intellectual disabilities, their employment rate ranges from 19% employment to 30%, depending on what survey you're looking at. So Congress, in the middle of the recession in 2008, actually passed $11 million to pilot college programs for students with intellectual disabilities. And you can see uh, California has 16, New York has 31, Ohio has 7, Florida has 16. So these programs are growing. There's more than 250 programs around the country. Students with ID used to be called MR. They learn differently um, and they may have some adaptive behavior. But Patty has helped us achieve a 100% placement rate of our graduates. Um, at the time of graduate or within three months of graduation. Not all of them have kept their jobs, but over 90% have kept their jobs. We and we're using federal dollars to start programs um, at the University of Cincinnati. Well, at, and we didn't even have to start the program at University of Cincinnati or Kent State because they found their own funding, but we did give money to Toledo, Youngstown, Marietta College, Columbus State Community College, Edison State Community College. And we believe that giving students with intellectual disabilities a college program where a good 40% of the college program is their internship every semester is a way to get those employment outcomes. And I think that's the key to why we have a 100% employment outcomes is because they leave with four very significant internship programs. Some have worked at Coxi Animal as an animal specialist. I don't even know what that animal is there. <laughs> and Columbus Museum of Art. So we try to get internships at Ohio State, but we have partnered with Coxi and the Columbus Museum of Art um, every year. Um, we focus on industry recognized credentials if that is critical to that career area. And I don't want to spend time on it, only like three minutes. We, this young man, his parents were his guardian. He lived in Texas. He, um, they came for a summer program and they kind of checked us out. And it was a three week summer program. And, um, and then after two years, he came and he lived uh, here in Columbus. Now this was a person who family said, I'm always gonna have to be there for this young man. <coughs> after two years in the program, he 
works 40 hours a week in central sterile supply, making $13 an hour and has the same benefits that I have. Now, isn't that a better outcome than living with your parents the rest of your life? Again, addressing so, the issue about students moving out of state and away from their parents' homes yeah. to be able to participate in programs like this. So again, addressing some of your concerns. Can you just clarify, out so the outcome data that you're referencing, is that for students who are going through the TOPS program? Yes. So you're working directly with that. Are you also working with No, I do not work no. with these. Okay. We're I developing. to make sure that I understood that. Right, That's right, right. right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. I'm giving a snippets of four different programs, yep. all that Wonderful. use internships to help build that bridge to employment. Okay, um, so the recommendations, and we're in the last three minutes of this session, so we wanna be able to take <coughs> questions too. Teach self-determination and self-advocacy skills. Kids need to know what they need. They need to have those self-regulation skills. They need to know, I don't get what that professor just said. I better either meet with a study buddy to go over the notes or go for tutoring or whatever the support <coughs> might be. Provide accommodations in high school that will be approved in college. Sometimes our high schools over accommodate and modify far too much and then when they get to college there's that struggle. So it's important. Um, avoid course modifications in high school if your son or daughter or student is planning on going to college and participate in Steve summer camps. Internships can be done at the high school level. Um, again, make sure the high school has that liability. Question? How do we know what accommodations are approved at a college level? Um, you, you can talk with their Office of Disability Services and they will determine what accommodations are going to be approved. It's a very individualized process, and I don't wanna um, pretend that it's easy to know, but if there is a history of an accommodation working in high school, then often that college will continue But you had said that they give too much. So like, is there certain things that we often allow in high school that universities are like, oh no, no, we can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Accommodating. Accommodating. Yes. That's modifying the curriculum. Yes. That That's happens. the biggest thing. Just that call. happens all yeah. the time. We and are so case managers. You yep. will look at documentation and tell you what would fly and what wouldn't fly. And every university is normally willing to do that. Okay. So um, when I send you the PowerPoint, you'll get a few extra slides on how to teach self-determination and how to teach self-advocacy skills. Um, this is Patty's job description as a career specialist and job coach. She develops and coordinates internships. She assists students in learning and maintaining job skills, and she provides guidance. The important thing is she fades over time because we want to try to build the natural supports at that internship site, teach the student how to <laughs> access those natural supports so that that person can be independent at some point. We, ideally, we don't want to be providing um, supports once they're independent on the job. Yeah, it's really important to fade because you don't often, often they like act a different way when a job coach is there. I'm kind of like, you know, and so like you don't necessarily know what their true deficits are until you fade. And so oftentimes, you know, we try to be at the work site for the first two weeks. You know, now we've been there longer. We've been there all semester for some. But, you know, our ideal case is to be there for two weeks and then to start to fade. But one thing that I try to let work sites know is that they can always reach out to me by email, by phone. We will be there, you know, as quick as we can get there if there's an intervention that's needed. But sometimes that, that fading is really important. Okay. And, and if I can just um, offer a suggestion that I realize at a company's perspective might not work, because I realize this costs you money, but a suggestion is maybe like a job trial with maybe somebody just to see, like to help the the worker feel comfortable maybe because a lot of it is our work our students are very like they think they can't do it you know oftentimes I do truly have a student on my caseload no joke that thinks he's a superhero and doesn't have to work summers you know <laughs> but he's a very capable worker um, so a lot of it is getting the the worker to buy into the fact that they're capable and parents to see like they did this for you know I'm not sure what's a um, a good amount of time like to do a job trial to be completely honest with you because I realize that's a lot 
But I think even if the parents, can, if you can say to the parents, your child was successful here. You know, they were able to do this, this, and this, and I do think this can work. Just a suggestion. All right. <laughs> so, um, unfortunately, there's no more time left for questions, but if you guys have them, you can ask me to take them in the hallway yes. or up in the car we will all be outside of this room I want to be respectful to those who are presenting after us but thank you for your attention and could I get the sign-up sheet um, all right and I will mail you the PowerPoint the envisioning curriculum and the information about how to say right consortium all right thank you for coming and if anybody wants a copy of the presentation I have like four Thank you so much. Does anybody want to be Yes. Yes. Which is good to know. I mean, you were there. So nice to meet you. We
show you the Specific hiring and uh, retained employment initiative in the United States. And so we're going through both of these programs. Uh, Anna was kind enough to position us right before lunch, so we're more than happy to answer questions extendedly, but a um, lot of stuff here. Um, but first of all, my name is Jason Gepper. I'm a case manager in the Office of Disability Services at Wright State University, and I oversee all of our disability employment, vocational, career um, initiatives at Wright State, and I'm also one of the OSA project coordinators. I'm Jen Bargy. I'm also a case manager in the Office of Disability Services at Wright State. Um, I have served as our office learning specialist working with students with ADHD and learning disabilities in addition to also doing OSAA um, program management and ability advising. Hi, I'm Molly Four. I'm an HR specialist at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and I'm also the disability program manager for Wright-Patterson and then um, some other installations, military installations for the Air Force across the country. All right. So I've done variations of this presentation before, and I always like to talk about why I'm passionate about this work. I was a first-generation graduate um, in, in college of, of my family, both for an undergraduate and master's level degree. I remember uh, my own difficulties, not really knowing how higher ed worked, um, having to kind of find out on my own. Um, that always attracted me towards working towards at-risk populations of all sorts, international students, student athletes, um, first generation in a number of capacities. And when I came out to Wright State, I had the opportunity to work on this NSF grant to get more students with disabilities successfully placed into STEM fields. Um, so that's one reason I, I had a personal investment, but I'm also very concerned about the college student debt bubble. Um, I think college is rising in cost way too quickly, as many of my generation would attest and agree with. Um, I think debt load is staggering in the best case situation. Even if you get your degree and you get that job and you're not hunting, I mean, some of us have joked, you know, Ken and I will joke, maybe we're going to be paying off our student loans for the rest of our lives. I mean, and then if you don't graduate and you still have 50, 60, 70, 80 thousand dollars in debt, that is insane. That is so difficult to overcome. And to me, I'm a big believer that um, even if you get that degree, if you're not getting a commensurate job, it's just a piece of paper. It's a waste of money. And uh, where that translates into disabilities, if you look at a snapshot, we know we have about um, a diagnosis rate about 1 in 59 with autism. You look at four-year degree completion um, in six years, and it's 57% for the general population. It's only 34% for individuals with disabilities. Um, for those individuals uh, with disabilities, postgraduate employment, 84% um, of the general population versus 53% for graduates with disabilities. If you look at the rates for autism spectrum disorder uh, population, it's only about 20 to 30% after obtaining that four-year degree. And when you look at the numbers even further, about half of that is what we consider commensurate. So not working, you know, no, you know like no, nothing against working at Starbucks or Kroger's, but you're not getting your five, six, seven-year 
you know, four-year degree um, to work there. And so that's a big issue. So um, my, my you know, kind of passion to this is just if we're taking the money from these students, any type of student, but if we're taking the, the money from individuals with autism and higher ed and we're not getting them to where they want to be, I mean, I think we're failing them. We're taking a bunch of money and we're, we're throwing them out. And uh, that, that's really distressing to me. And so I've been very happy to be um, on some of these initiatives um, reversing that trend. So there are definitely, from a, when we were in higher, we're, we're talking specifically in higher ed, and we've identified some gaps um, that really kind of precipitate a lot of these issues. So first of all, disability services. We um, are geared, most disability services office, are there disability services professionals in here? A few of you? So you guys know, we are geared mostly towards academic accommodations, right? <laughs> and. What that means is that a lot of that other wraparound support, uh, if you guys were in the previous session, Margo talked about how there's a lot of wraparound support in K-12 systems, and it doesn't just address academic needs a lot of times. It addresses social skill development and the like. And so when we in higher ed focus only on the academic needs, we're missing those social skill development that a lot of these students need to then transition out effectively into employment. <coughs> Um, we also tend to focus our developmental programming on transition in. We get everybody in, we bring them on campus, we make them feel great, we do great orientation programs, and then second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year, we don't spend time talking about what it means to leave. And even students without disabilities tend to freak out, right? And so when we focus our transition on transition in and we are not looking at the other end, we're creating a deficit. Um, academic advising, academic advisors have really large caseloads and we understand that, um, but what happens is it becomes about managing processes at a lot of schools. Um, how many times, if you guys have college students, has your college student had to schedule an appointment just to register for classes? Because the process is so complex. There is no need for that. We need to simplify that. That way academic advisors can focus on the developmental piece and address academic concerns or potential social concerns that ultimately impact academics, right? Um, career services. Career services are, are great. They're great resources. But especially what we found for our students with disabilities, and specifically our students on the spectrum, was that they could provide some assistance, mock interviews and the like, but not to the degree and the, with the specific specificity needed to address the challenges that they were facing in an interview process. And so that's really time intensive and they just, those departments just didn't have the resources and they also didn't have the disability related knowledge base to understand how disability was showing up in these, in these situations. And then um, a lot of higher ed now, especially in Ohio, there's a push for voc rehab um, to work alongside um, higher ed. Unfortunately, what we found is that voc rehab tends to lack assistance um, for non-entry level or degree caliber employment, and that's been problematic for a number of our students. So what, how do we deal with this? <laughs> so I know that um, Margo, in the previous um, presentation, if you guys were here, talked about OSAA. OSAA was a program that we created through National Science Foundation funding with, um, at the time, two community colleges, Columbus State and Sinclair, Sinclair and Dayton, and Ohio State and us. And it's all directed at using that NCAA student athlete model of advising, which if you guys know anything about athletics, and especially Division I schools, there is a ton of wraparound support for those students, right? There are study groups, there are individual academic advisors, they have their own special set of academic advisors. Mm -hmm. advisors. So we took that model and we designed OSAA. And what that means is that we can really focus on addressing the challenges or the barriers that disability presents in higher ed. And the whole goal was meant to address underrepresentation of, of people with disabilities in STEM majors specifically. And then move them from intro, like their transition into college, perseverance through degree, and then transition out into the workforce. So those are, that's okay. Our interventions are listed there. Jason, we can probably share the presentation if you guys are interested. That would be great. <laughs> so this is kind of what our model looks like visually. 
So you can see the big yellow person, that's Jason and I. Jason and I had um, caseloads of students, which would be your green OSAA scholars. And then basically, what we became was the, the contact on campus. Because colleges are literally small cities, right? And how, where do you have to go to get your bill paid? Where do you have to go to get a new ID? Where do you have to go to make sure that your dining card is working? Whatever, a roommate issue. So we can address all of those things on, college, on the college campus. We can do academic support, working with faculty and academic advisors. We can do physical support if we, if we have students who need that. And then we can branch out into um, vocational support and internships having that ability to talk about disability-related accommodations and how do students advocate for those needs. Are you coming from the um, Disability Education Office? Yeah, like so when the grant was initially started, it was housed in our College of Computer Science and Engineering. And then we stretched our grant out until 2016. And a couple years before we ran out of money, they folded us into the Office of Disability Services. So Jason and I have been housed in the Office of Disability Services since 2014. So we did have some office support there, which was nice. All right, so recurring theme of what you know, Margo talked about for OSA and what we found to be the case is that you want to be working with these students early and often and consistently throughout their college experience. And for me, I'm a big person, much like many of our individuals on the spectrum, they want to know why. They want to want to know why they're doing something, where they're going to be, where they're going to go. And I'm the same way. And so for me, when I came on to the grant about year two of that grant, um, I started creating a number of visuals that we could provide to students to let them know what they needed to be by the time they left college. We had a lot of individuals still in this day and age who think if I just get decent grades and I graduate and I get my degree, I'm going to get a great job. And if that era ever existed, it is over. You know, you need to have, you know, you have to have employment, you need to be in clubs, you need to have soft skills, hard skills. So this was conceptually what I told our students who had to be. And also we know there's unfortunately prejudice and discrimination in the employment process. So how do you overcome that? You know, while we want everyone to be nice and caring and considerate, that's sometimes not the world we're inside. They really grill these students. You need to be better than everybody else when you come out. You need to be skilled in all these areas. But if you are, if you listen to what we do across four, five, six years, you're gonna get you're gonna get that job or get into that grad school you want. We have the numbers to show if this worked, but <coughs> those five areas would be the academics. Uh, we're a near open enrollment institution at Wright State. Uh, if you don't get those grades and you don't get them right off the bat, you might not be back long enough to benefit from the rest of the stuff we do. And actually, the first couple of years we had this program before I came on, we had an almost single focus on the, the STEM identity. Do I, do I want to be in a lab? Do I want to work in technology? Yes, yes. But then employers would say, okay, let's bring in some of these students. Where are their resumes? What are their grades? It wasn't looking so good. So when I came on, my goal was to really delve into that developmental piece. So um, not only did they want to be in STEM, they could actually get employed in STEM fields. Um, involvement, uh, especially for any of our individuals with disabilities, but also with autism. You know, you think of bullying, you think of some of those things that happen in K-12. through You see a disinclination or a fear to get involved because of that, and that's something that we need to work on. And sometimes there's not that point of contact, typically, in a higher ed environment to do that. So we're all about, once your grades are stabilized, what's that next step you can take? Whether it's volunteering, a club, anything. Um, from there, uh, let's translate that to an internship. Let's translate that to an experiential learning opportunity. It doesn't have to be an internship. It can be research. It can be a number of other opportunities that allow you to apply your major um, in a non-textbook fashion. Um, we do work with all of our individuals on image. We work a lot on the resume and the cover letter, knowing that sometimes our individuals um, need more uh, recurrence, more specificity, and that disability added element when we're talking about these things. The formal attire, the social media, all of our students have LinkedIn's. Um, and then through all of this, you know, that personality comes out a bit more. People who are scared, who are nervous, um, a little more quiet, um, they get that, that confidence. They go, I can do this. That stacks up over the, over the case of those four, five, six years. And then especially after they get back from that internship, it's gone really well. Um, it's given them that enthusiasm to get ready to go on into the world, which is really great. Um, you know, and that, and that doesn't really come until we get these other four areas kind of locked down. So another visual I provide is just kind of letting our students know what they should be doing in an ideal four-year process, and this is kind of what it looks like. You know, you're transitioning that first year, you're developing these self-responsibility skills, our one-on-one coaching, 
uh, is focused around that. Um, you know, maybe if you're stabilized in the coursework, you start getting involved developing some of those soft skills. Year two, you're building upon that. Year three, you better be looking at internships if you haven't already. Uh, we want you to be doing something hands-on with your degree. And then by year four, um, we want them to think about transition out. But we also want them, one of the strengths of our program was uh, these folks who made it through could then kind of start up proselytizing the incoming uh, students, saying this worked. Uh, here's what we learned, uh, here's why you should do it, and then to be able to provide that perspective and advice from a student versus a staff um, perspective. Um, and really, we want them to have an exit plan. You know, there's a lot of students even without disabilities that, you know, they show up two months to the career services, two months before they graduate. It's like, okay, I need a job, don't have a resume, haven't thought about this really, and, you know, that's not what we want our students to be set up for. We want them to really have known what that vision is um, from literally year one. So does all this work? Again, we are a near open enrollment institution. Um, our institutional average for first year attention is 60%. Uh, our cohorts have had an 89% as an entirely at risk population. Um, and that also surpasses state and national averages substantially. Uh, we have a 71.4% graduation rate with, with these students, which again, 40.3 for our general population at Wright State University. That is huge, a 31% piece. Uh, the average graduate GPA is a 3.14, and we weren't just picking the high flyers, you know, out of high school, the people at 4.0s. We were taking on anybody who wanted to be a part of this organization. Um, but that's a uh, GPA that allows you to get competitive employment or into grad school. Um, and then again, we, uh, Kind of a dirty thing in higher ed is for our longest amount of time, we just said it's too hard to track our graduates and see what they're doing with their degrees. It's just too much work. It's really not uh, <laughs> Facebook stalking, LinkedIn stalking, <laughs> sending out some surveys. If they don't respond to surveys, just take an afternoon and call. <laughs> the numbers on the resume say, hey, you got the job. Uh, turns out it's really not that hard to know where our students are going. And the good news is 81% of our students were employed. Um, or uh, commensurately, or going into continued education, which is huge. You know, these are the outcomes we want, and that rate is fantastic. I looked into the research, and uh, there are very few people that can boast that. And again, this is, uh, you know, just proof that this process works. And it turns <coughs> out, if you looked into the different disability types, this idea of meeting with an advisor monthly, going to a group scholars meeting monthly, knowing that this happened every single month, they had all this planned out from the beginning of the year and actually from the beginning of their college experience, that structure that individuals with autism tended to appreciate and they were our most, uh, typically our most reliant population. They'd be showing up to our group meetings a half hour, hour early, uh, the ones who'd stay <laughs> till the end. So uh, really, really good population to work with with this program. So takeaways, key takeaways from our OSA program is that we found that clearly defined goals, steady encouragement, support, and direction allowed us to work with students and scaffold appropriately every year of their experience, which then leads to our outcome data, which I'm absolutely happy to talk about anytime we can. <laughs> um, ability advising is the key component. Um, there are a lot of programs out there that don't, uh, or have maybe similar models, but don't spend a lot of the same time with students individually one-on-one -on -one or with the structure. We found that the reason that we have such good outcomes is because we do ability advising. Um, having that person on campus, having them set goals with you, having them help you address challenges, and then celebrate with you when you meet your, su meet your success is really, really crucial. Um, it would be absolutely impossible for us to have done what we do without the ability advising component. Um, and most of these interventions have very little cost aside from our time and our salary. So really, there are a lot of programs that focus on maybe giving people assistive technology, which are great, and they're, that can be really useful. But, and we had the flexibility, luckily, within our grant to provide that when it was needed, but the biggest factor was really our time. And that was what allowed us to be successful. I have a question. Yeah. Your ability advising, that is different from their academic. Yes, right? yes. Okay. So we are essentially, they were required to check in with us once a month and we could <laughs> check in on the academic stuff, but I'm not gonna come in from a knowledge of a program or a major. I'm not gonna come in and with a checklist of classes they have to take. 
We're going to talk about challenge areas. Maybe they're academic, maybe they're social. Um, we're going to come up with a plan. We're going to talk about goals. Where do you see yourself in a year? Where do you see yourself in two years? Where do you want to be in five years? Um, and then every month we're going to kind of check in and make sure courses are going okay. And it's really about kind of intensive developmental advising. It's a really well-rounded approach. Um, which allows us to address problems before they become problems. Uh, do you have paper, an actual paper published on this? We are in the process of working on one. <laughs> um, our PI is has taken on tons of other responsibilities, and the research professor who used to work with us is retired. So we are halfway through our paper. <laughs> How do you require them? I mean, do you, is it like if you're not, if you don't show up for a meeting, then are you not in the program? So, uh, so initially. Um, we, well, actually still, we had, we tied our OSAA programming to a Choose Ohio First scholarship, and Jason, Jason really oversaw the scholarship component of it, um, but that, so for, especially for our Ohio students, they, there was a scholarship component tied to it, right, and they had to meet certain requirements, mm -hmm. and part of that, but in all honesty, most, you had a, we had a number of students that just got so used to doing it that they just came even more often than they were required to, right? Because when you find that one person who can help you address challenges and then direct you to the right resources, that is key. So there was that component initially. In um, a single year, how many students are you two guys that haven't advised? So just in OSAA, at the height, it was what? I mean, at the height at the height of it, we probably had a membership of maybe a hundred ish, at, like what we would consider active members, people who are meeting up regularly. We would have some students. Um, our definition for these criterion are people who met up um, for more than one meeting ever. The second they come for that second meeting to where we had a chain, where um, you know they weren't just coming in with their parents who said be a part of this group, and we never saw them again. You know, for better or for worse, uh, they were with us, and we would kind of whether they never showed up after that second time and failed out, or whether they stuck with us from the, the, the long haul. That was kind of how we created our metrics. And those, that, that caseload was separate than our specific, like disability services caseload. Jason and I handle additionally 250 students just for accommodations. But we tend to use the same methods with those students that we you use. Because you've got to work these. on what the next step is. Mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. yep. And you see you gradually get them clubs then into yep. internships, then into job stuff, you slowly transitioning yes. out of academic before graduation. So yes. A slow mm -hmm. transition. Yes. So the one thing I wanted to comment about with the scholarship, it was very nice, but at the same time, out of all, all of our STEM majors, where the, the NSF STEM majors lined up with Ohio STEM majors, and I was very curious, is it just because we're giving them a financial benefit? The numbers actually held up pretty consistently between our students funded, not funded. More interestingly, sometimes we'd have students who lose that scholarship because of a GPA component attached to it. Very often, they'd still just keep showing up to meetings. So even after they were no longer eligible for the funding, you know, they'd be a part of it. They could see it's still making um, growth in their own trajectories, and they'd stick with us. So I found that to be pretty, pretty nice. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you've also picked, I know in Ohio we're moving with um, OOD counselors in colleges. Are you connecting with that as well? So we've actually had an OOD um, counselor who comes into our office once a week for years. Um, and yeah, I know there's a new initiative to mm -hmm. put them full time in colleges. Or I'm not sure. After yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. This. So we attempt to work with OOD, but one of the okay. things that um, we mentioned earlier was that it's okay. It's okay. Um, the challenge that we have there is that we're, we're having students come out with really high level degrees, you know, engineering degrees or whatnot, mm -hmm. and OOD is wanting to put them in Lower service degree. level positions, okay. or they don't have the job coaches who have the experience in that degree work field to transition okay. them effectively. So that's why Jason ended up partnering with Molly. Like she can kind of that. talk about that. Okay. So. Now, now that's the state want to put them in that, or the no? It's just an initiative well, opportunity yeah. for Ohio's with disabilities, cool. and so it's just a counselor kind of idea. That's, well, that's our state vote. Yeah. Yeah. You have a degree in computer science, and you're going to have work at Walmart. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's what that's what Walmart. essentially would tend to happen. Yeah, that's stupid. Yep. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> we absolutely agree with that. Yes. Uh, I, I want to know, do you have a checkoff list for students to have to complete their first year, their second year? Is that uh, a checkoff Yeah, list? yeah, that, that model I showed you is very much, it's reiterated, literally we'll sit down, well you actually use the resume as kind of a template. I'll look at a resume and I'll go, okay, your GPA is really nice, the rep, but you have nothing else to fill out that resume. 
Where's that club or that soft skill? Where is, so that's where the ability advising comes in. Is, and and there, there are some students who are like, hey, I have a 3.0, I'm in clubs, I have an internship, why do I still have to meet? We're like, there's always a the next step for you. So we always kind of, as they achieve a goal, we always find another, another goal to push them towards. There's never a good enough, there's never a, you're done. And is there an online portfolio um, tool that you would recommend utilizing with any of these types of students? Because portfolios tend to also help people visually see yeah. what they've accomplished. We use a lot of LinkedIn. Yep. Um, we, use LinkedIn. we used to use like actual portfolios, but that was just like obviously a like dinosaur age, right? So moving, Jason started really pushing his students to use LinkedIn, and now we encourage them to utilize their LinkedIn almost as an online portfolio. And then obviously okay. if some students have blogs or whatnot, they can expand those out as well. Um, some of our, I know some of my computer engineering, computer science people like to do that sort of stuff in addition, and then they'll just link that on their LinkedIn. I, I mean, but the, right. yeah, the yeah, thing is, is there's so much, you know, again, prejudice, discrimination out there. LinkedIn, I mean, it's nice if someone has an e-portfolio, but LinkedIn, you can put all that stuff on, you can link to it, you can have the internship providers and the faculty write recommendations, and that gets rid of the concern, can the student do this? No, they have testimonials on right. it. So there's, you know, and that and HR, I mean, it, they, they that. show that they use LinkedIn. So, you know, that's where we yeah. try to go versus separate platforms. So from the first year they're doing LinkedIn? Um, it really depends where students at. Again, we, academics first. We don't want to start stretching them too far in different areas until we know they're going to retain. Um, the only other thing I want to say about Jen, with the, she mentioned the ability advising model. What we do is we consider ourselves supplemental to the academic to the case management, to the career services. So we don't try to recreate the wheel, we still refer them to those resources, but what we do is we fill in the gaps that don't get approached. Say someone has a math learning related disability, or academic, academic advisor's like, well I only signed them up for one math class, but they're in an accounting class and an economics class. You know, Then we look up and hey, that's a, a, a recipe for you being on probation after the first semester, let's make sure we avert that. Again, that's not something that comes up, or career services, they don't really know how to talk about looking into a dis disability inclusive employer, you know, how can we fill in the gap that doesn't get covered in a traditional career services? So we just, we're, we're there to tie those things together, make sure they're using them and fill in the gaps. The Silicon Valley, <laughs> they're all on the spectrum and they avoid the labels. I had my slideshow that I'm gonna show this afternoon, checked at a, disability, at a tech company, I won't say which one, make sure I can put the A word on their founder. <laughs> and so you've got these big shoulder workshops out in Silicon Valley, and they ride around in fancy buses, <laughs> and they avoid the labels. Yep. And they they go in, they're uh, going to they're print all the print our stamp. And then we've got out here. I've been to Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. I've gone into a tech company where you've got a great big office with a hundred people at computers, not even in cubicles, just in a row of desks. Hundred people in this room, and it's totally silent. Mm -hmm. That's and they're all glued to their computers. I can't identify it, I can't tell you where it is. But it's a big name and I was there very recently. <laughs> and that's a, I mean, I, I have to wonder, you know, obviously, we, we have to talk to students a lot um, because disability identity is a piece that we have to address when we're working with students because higher ed is a completely different ball game and the work world is also a completely different ball game. The thing that blows my mind is just how actively Silicon Valley avoids right. the labels. So imagine, like, don't put the A word on our people and check my slides. What could be? I mean, imagine the change that could occur if people embrace. Well, that's that, exactly right? what I talked to them about. Yep. That's why I'm here now in Silicon Valley at Wright Patterson Air Force Base mm -hmm. yesterday, and I did it for free. Mm -hmm. I couldn't deal with all this stupid forms. So <laughs> 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 well, it did. Makes that one. That's. I. I mean, I think that those are absolutely <laughs> important and valid points and so we spend a lot of time actually because the social piece is important to our students development and it's important to their ability to persevere in their degree programs. The other thing on LinkedIn, let's keep the weird politics and all the weird stuff off your LinkedIn mm -hmm. profile. Yes, yes, yes. thank you for reiterating that. Yep. Leave it at home, yep. not on LinkedIn, get it off of Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yep, because people business. look at that. They, uh, some of our students are always so surprised when we talk about social media presence. Oh, yeah. And you would think that these like digital natives would kind of be a little bit more. But oh, I know yeah. I have a middle schooler and she thinks that I'm crazy when I say these things. So I know I'm not alone. Yeah. But just in, how can you guys help, right? We talked a lot about practices. There are things that, that no matter where you work, 
um, you could absolutely implement on, on your own too. So emphasize conversation that kind of goes back to how do we you know, accept a label maybe as part of our identity. Mentoring and goal setting. Goal setting is so huge. So disability services specifically, we try to make access to our um, services as easy as possible. We automate the process. Um, it's just one less thing that students have to worry about, right? Academic advising, again, we kind of talked about this. We work really closely with academic advisors to try to, A, help them simplify processes, and then they can also address some of the de developmental stuff that students need to do as well. Just wondering if you're working with the professors on campus at all yeah. um, and opening the doors of access for them. We do uh, what we can. Yeah. What does <laughs> but that faculty, look like? um, so anyone, Jason and I do a lot of the training through our office, okay. and anyone that wants trained, we will absolutely do. What happens with faculty is we tend to spend a lot of time one on one with them. Okay. It tends to be reactive, but um, more often than not, once we've been able to have those conversations, then they come back to us yes. and we've been able to establish good relationships. We did succeed in one case with someone who wound up overseeing an initiative to get active flip classes, and we got a toehold with him, got him to read a book on universal design, and at least for his incentive system for um, faculty to create yeah. courses around that, that piece. So we, you know, every once in a while we luck out and we get a more proactive contact that really benefits, but mm -hmm. a bit of reactive. Yep. Okay. I have a quick question. Yeah. The students that come into your program, they have to come in with a 3.14? No. No, no, that's that, what that, they That was our outcome with. data. That's right. So, data. right state, when Jason says that we're a near open enrollment institution, right. that pretty much means we're an open enrollment institution. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah. so, look at the SAT, ACT scores as I mean, no. admissions is supposed to, um, oh, but okay. that, I'll be honest, I, I have an increasingly large percentage of my caseload that is coming in with very low ACTs. Yes. Um, some that do, that require, that do raise a red flag because they're going to require intervention in some areas, right? Um, but that does not limit who we will work with, right? So we are working with a really broad range of, of students. We let anyone into this program day one, or even if people found out about it year two, year three. I mean, at any point, we don't check GPAs. That's one scholarship that have some thresholds that were required by the state. But otherwise, aside from that one particular piece, just anybody who wanted to be part of it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, someone with no disability could be. Well, they had to be no. registered yeah. with a disability. So that there is yes. that's the threshold, right? Like you have to be cut, and that's yeah. kind of a remnant of our grant, right? Like mm -hmm. we are working with students with disabilities, so they did have to register with our um, office. And what that means is that we had, especially a number of students um, on the autism spectrum. They don't necessarily receive official ADA academic accommodations, but we register them with our office anyway so that we can do supplemental programming like this um, so that they can then be part of OSAA or the RACE program, which is specific for students with disabilities. Um, so that's an option, but that, that is a criterion. Mm -hmm. so, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So you each have 250 students on your caseload. Yeah. Plus you have these students. Um, yeah. Luckily, there's not a ton of OSAA students right now. Um, because most of our cohort has graduated and we're, we are, have not actively recruited in a couple of years um, <coughs> or a year or so um, as we've just kind of been graduating those students. There, and there is some overlap with our caseload. So, so are your job descriptions changed based on? Well, we wrote this into our job description okay. when they yep. folded us into Yeah, the we're office. technically disability and STEM support specialists yeah. okay. is our so title. We had the flexibility to do that. Okay. For the sake of uh, just the rest yeah. of our timeline, so we can actually Molly talk about her grade program. Just uh, any program, any questions? Because we'll be sticking around that gap, that 15 minute gap between here and lunch. We didn't even talk in lunch too. Uh, if you could just yeah. write those out, we'll get them all answered. So we're very passionate about this. I just want to make sure she doesn't yeah. uh, run out at the end. So last on this slide before Molly gets to talk to you. Um, what do you say? Like these are some suggestions we have for for people who are working with this student population, right? And some people we've heard this before. Well, you guys know that they have a disability, or specifically, you know that they have autism. We don't. How are we supposed to address that? Well, in all actuality, when we started OSAA, we were not housed in the Office of Disability Services. We were housed in the College of Computer Science and Engineering, which means we were not privy to disability-specific information. And unless I go look, or students on my specific caseload. I don't necessarily look at disability specific information until they disclose it, which means that I am asking about strengths and weaknesses and challenges, and most of them end up disclosing disability, and then that becomes part of our conversation. But 
they then disclose to us in a way that they're comfortable with. And that's what we found is that us having consistent relationships allows them to then open up and disclose in ways that are comfortable and allows us to set appropriate goals. We're quite sure this model would work for any student and any marginalized student, but any student in general. Um, is, this, is this model written up in anything? Um, but in NSF reports, um, yeah. it's pretty yeah. much yeah at that point. So, but that will be part of our One publication thing I've efforts. Seen, I travel around a whole lot, and like if I get uh, hired by the uh, uh, like major university lecture service, they really know how to pull it. But I've done stuff where I've been hired by the disability office. They don't know how to get out of the bubble. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say where I went. It's just somewhere in the United States. Yep. Well, they don't think that to contact the uh, veterinary department or something like that. Yeah. They're just staying in yep. their own bubble. Yep. No, and, absolutely. And silos are Well, I'm, 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 what I'm trying to do now in the talks, I'm doing, I'm trying to bust up the silos. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm at Wright-Patterson one day free. Yep. Tech another day, a cattle meeting another day, sustainable egg another day. Absolutely. Yep. You know. Well, that's, that's huge, right? Like that's, because we've had this discussion a lot. Like when we were housed in a college and not disability services, we had to learn how to break through a lot of those silos in order to best serve our students. And we took that mentality with us. Like, so now, you know, it's a lot of working across disciplines, working well, what across. What you've got to do now is you've got to write your stuff up. <laughs> one thing I've learned in a long career in cattle, so one of the things that helped me have an effect on the livestock industry, I wrote about myself. Mm -hmm. I do a successful project and I wrote about it. Like my McDonald's and Wendy's animal welfare, and I got five scientific papers on that. I cannot emphasize enough, write it up exactly what you've done there. Will do. <laughs> Moves our priority in something list that's accessible on the databases, something permanent. Yes, thank you. That was good. I needed that motivation. No, I'm sure <laughs> you've sure got it. It's got to be a priority, right? One of my audience right? books, if you had a paper, it'd be going right in there. Right? There's no paper. You even have press releases? Do you have anything? <laughs> um, uh, well, we might have some, I mean, yeah. we might have some stuff all over the place, but we can we probably find like, something. Like, Oh, a Wright State University autism, uh, and here didn't come up. Mm -hmm. I just did it now yeah. on my phone. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, we, we've up. gone through a lot of leadership transitions. I think one of the hardest part is new administration. Unfortunately, some scandals fairly recently. We oh, lost, lost, have, lost a lot of standard bearers. You told so, us yeah. right now in this talk, you got to get it right Yep, and, we, and that's what we've been working on is just trying to find some new, new blood that can kind of help us um, as kind of <laughs> lower tier folks at Wright State. Yeah. But we have started collecting and making some, uh, some connections to hopefully kind of get this stuff going with, with new leaders, new people coming out. What you've done challenge. is you're helping, you're, you're making sure the student doesn't like trash some classes, mm -hmm. you know, deal with that, not take, you know, three math heavy classes at the same time and set up to fail. Then you're getting them into the student clubs. Then you're going internships. Yep. In other words, you're starting that gradual transition. Mm -hmm. See, that's super, super important. Yep. So really quickly, before we uh, kind of turn things over to Molly to talk about autism at work, I want to kind of talk about wh why autism at work is so important to me and Jen kind of working and doing this work and, you know, wanting that next step to be there, why it's so important, what she's done on her end. Um, you know, we talked a lot about things we can do, you know, on our end to help prepare students, essentially autism masks, what was talked about in an earlier session, you know, this idea of we do go train students how to handshake and all this different stuff. Um, and that's great, you know, eye contact, this and that, to overcome some of those biases in interviewing. But that being said, you know, there's a lot of stuff there that's kind of dumb. Uh, I like to show uh, this infographic, and uh, let's see if I can blow it up a bit. So, all right, it's a smiley guy, and they talk about how basically we see somebody, and in 30 seconds we already make a decision on whether we're going to hire them or not. It's all about stupid stuff. Are they handshaking with the right grip? Are they making eye contact? Can they make witty banter? You know, all, uh, what's their posture look like? How fashionista are they? You know, these are things that I guess maybe <coughs> in a front-facing, very dynamic customer service job might be important. The problem is, we all, and I've said on, on hiring boards, we, we do this regardless of our background. We say how dumb it is, and then we take that as the number one priority when we're hiring. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just, uh, you know, are we, are we getting the best people out of the process with that approach? Um, sorry, I've got to go back through. Um, you know, I would argue no. 
Almost there. Put your title slide up there so I can take a picture of it. That's about the only thing I'm going to get. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let's see. I can do. Uh, can I do that in a little bit? Yeah, okay, that'll be fine. Okay. Yeah. So, so, um, but yeah. So, for jobs that are not front facing, why do we put all this pressure to have these this the specific skill set take priority in interviews? Um, you know, how many of us know somebody who's completely incompetent at their job, horrible at their job? Everything that we overemphasize in an interview is in their areas of weakness, typically, and all of their strengths tend to be areas that are underemphasized or ignored altogether in a traditional interview. So I'm going to turn it over to Molly to talk about an issue she created the base to kind of combat this. All right, it's time for lunch. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Molly. I'm just kidding. Five minutes. Yeah. Um, so Jason and I met through the Workforce Recruitment Program. If you guys are in higher education and don't know anything about it, I don't have a slide on it, but please Google Workforce Recruitment pro Program or the website is wrp.gov. Um, it connects higher education, uh, faculty and disability services offices with federal and state government offices to offer internship programs for these students <coughs> at no cost to the organization. So that's a huge win for my managers when I'm talking to them about the benefits of this program. And again, it's for um, students and graduates with disabilities. So um, Jason already talked about kind of the interview process and what most managers look for. We kind of threw that out the window when we were looking at hiring individuals on the autism spectrum. So what we did was, you know, Jason went out and solicited his students and grads that had autism to volunteer to participate in this. They would have to disclose their disability. We needed to know that they had autism and that they were eligible for this program. Then I, in turn, looked at their um, majors and made some connections with different offices across our installation. We have over 13,000 civilian employees at Wright-Patterson Wright Air Force Base in Dayton. It's a huge um, employer. We're the largest single-site employer in Ohio. We have a lot of opportunities that we can be offering to these individuals. Once we made those matches and kind of paired up their degrees with the different offices, I talked to the managers, um, explained what we were trying to do, um, told them what to expect in an interview session. You know, you're not going to get that handshake. Um, you might not get any handshake if they have sensory issues. They might be, you know, moving around in their chair, wiggling, or doing some um, some things that just you might not be um, privy to in a normal structured interview process. Another thing we did was make the uh, interviews at Wright State so the, com the candidate was very comfortable with the setting. We didn't have to, you know, take them on base and get a pass and do all that craziness. Um, so they were in a setting, an environment that they knew. Jason was there. I got to know these candidates as well. We all sat in on every interview. We threw out the structured questions and just had a conversation, an open dialogue with the candidate. Um, next slide. Okay. How did we go about convincing hiring managers? So a lot of people, you know, when they hear disability or the A word, they kind of tense up and think, oh, that's accommodations, that's a lot of headaches, I don't want to do this. Um, people with disabilities in general bring different perspectives to problem solving. They've had to go through a lot of obstacles in life. And we need that as an employer. When we're faced with problems and we're trying to, you know, research and develop, you know, different planes and, and test systems to go out in those planes. We need people with those different perspectives. In addition to that, people on the autism spectrum may offer these other um, benefits like the focus, um, unique perspectives, huge attention to detail, um, direct and open communication, which is sometimes hard to swallow for people if they don't understand that. So again, that was another thing that we tried to socialize with the managers before the interview process. So next slide. Okay. Once we made our initial selections, we had, a, we'll go through some of the results on the next slide. We had about 15 selections. Last year was our first cohort. Uh, we did a lot of training and awareness for those organizations. Um, we set up mentors to help um, coach the individuals. So these are people that volunteered for these roles as a mentor. They were very active in making sure that these individuals were motivated and comfortable and set up for success. Um, there was training provided to the supervisors and the mentors to kind of tell them about, you know, what it means to employ someone with autism or how to coach them. Uh, we also had the employees fill out assessments, so individualized assessments so that the managers could know, okay, this person prefers a checklist when they're tasked a job, or this person is more of a visual learner, or they might be quiet, and that doesn't mean that they're, you know, put off it or anything. They just are a little more quiet than normal. Sorry to interrupt that flow, it's awesome. What are you using as programs or any um, resources that you're showing your employers 
um, for the preparation of hiring? Kind of like, are you using resources to help them, or is it more of a talk? It's more of a talk. So okay. we'll do like a training session for an hour where, you know, I have them all in the room and we talk about this may happen where they might need to take a break at lunch or go around for a walk when they get frustrated. Um, and it's not, it, it's trying to give them a, a look at what could happen. It's not mm -hmm. necessarily one size fits all. Yeah. Um, just this past year, which was our second year in the program, we partnered with somebody outside of the gate to offer the training. They're more specialized in autism. Yeah. So, um, Who was that? Positive Solutions Behavior Group. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and we also offer training to the employees. So, um, you know, it's all about prep with individuals on the spectrum. So we wanted to prepare them for what to expect for their first week. So they, you know, gate access. If you have ever been on a military installation, you have to go through a military gate and there's, you know, the military guards, they've got their rifle <laughs> there and check your pass. And it's very intimidating even if you're not on the spectrum. So we wanted to make sure they understood what to expect that first day. Um, another thing that we do with the candidates and employees is we have monthly luncheons. So um, our base is very big, large. Uh, a lot of these individuals, if we didn't have these luncheons, they wouldn't know that they could be working alongside someone that is also on the spectrum. So um, we bring everyone together. We do fun events like bowling, and then we also do kind of lunch and learns where they learn how to get into that permanent role because the internship period is a one-year temporary appointment, ultimately trying to get them to permanency. Next slide. Okay, so here's our results. I think I have one more slide after this, so we're almost done. Um, we had 15 participants last year in the program. We are converting 10 into permanency. Uh, the other five are still, you know, finishing out their internship period. They could be converted, but we're very happy with that rate. We weren't sure, you know, was we weren't sure what to expect at the beginning, and I think that's um, a great rate to have. Uh, the second cohort, which they've all onboarded now and we have 12 individuals so again we're going to keep checking in on them and the managers and the mentors to make sure you know that they're having a successful experience another thing we're doing is um, expanding this initiative now that it's kind of turnkey to other military installations across the united states um, and then also universities let's partner with ohio state or uc or you know whoever has that candidate pool that we can really tap into I have some flyers to help recruit build these pipelines and pass out after the presentation uh, jason and i were invited to participate in uh, a briefing or presentation at the pentagon in front of dod chair people and they were very impressed with uh, what we had done what we had leveraged and they're going to kind of uniformly expand that across other sectors too so we're really excited about that um, and then our whole inspiration for this program was Microsoft and SAP had a documentary on their Autism Network hiring initiative. So, next slide. Okay, this is a 90 second video just highlighting one of the interns from our first cohort who has been converted into permanency. Right. Let's get this going. Yep. I'm Joe Leary. I'm an Agile Engineering intern. We are right next to Air Force Base in the ADH Civil Engineering Group. I got my bachelor's degree just last spring. I've always been interested in how things work. My mom said that when I was little, I was obsessed with the vacuum cleaner and toys that had wheels, stuff like that. I got hired through the Workforce Recruitment Program. I've been trying to apply for a lot of jobs over the past few years, and they helped me get this one. I interviewed Jonah as part of the Workforce Recruitment Program. I was impressed with him from the beginning and until now. I'm still very impressed with him. Um, he really shines as an engineer. He is very detail-oriented and he looks at a problem from every angle, um, which is very necessary for an engineer. Yeah, I recently wrote a 20-page report about mobile denial barriers. It, it wasn't supposed to be that long. I wasn't planning for it to be that long. It just, I really got into it because I love writing so much. I have the PDD NOS, which stands for Progressive Developmental Disorder, <coughs> and otherwise specifies. So basically, I don't fall into any of the other categories. I guess I really first became aware of it when I was like in elementary school. My parents found out when I was two because I had so much stopped speaking and I was having trouble paying attention, I believe. That's how they figured out that I have autism. 
pretty hard for me to interact with people. So when I was in fourth grade, I was diagnosed with depression and then anxiety, so that was really tough. Yeah, I had to deal with a lot of bullying. Somewhere along the line, everything just came easier for me. It was about the time that I started writing fan fiction. I think that's what helped me. Just engaging in something that I was really good at and really enjoyed. I'm really happy here. The work environment is friendly. I enjoy the things I'm doing, so it's fun. And he has been converted to full-time employment, so he's there. He's there for good. Okay. I think we rapidly move through all that, but if you guys want to break out and go to lunch or have questions, we'll sort of start. Okay. Oh yeah. So, so what we're going to say. and I were just discussing lunch. Because this is lunch, people are able to stay in this room another 15 to 20 minutes to discuss with you guys what you might want to discuss. We're going to leave these flyers at the side. We don't have enough for everybody, so if you don't really need one or can take a picture of it, you would be able to take a picture of it. Just as a reminder, the campus dining facilities are not open today, but in